The Japanese, Joao Rodriguez observed, regarded the Europeans with equal fascination. They greatly wondered at our big and long noses, thick beards and red or fair hair, and considered all these things as so many defects. They called them the Southern Barbarians, which is not a very flattering term. Their eating habits were rather different. The Japanese were so polite, eating with chopsticks, etc. Whereas in those days, Europeans normally ate with just a knife and uh, with your fingers. And then, of course, the Japanese, most of the Japanese take a bath every day, whereas Europeans, I'm afraid, in those days, went for months and months and months without taking a bath. And to some extent, they deserved the epithet of barbarians. But however they were regarded, the missionaries were determined to stay in Japan. Our only desire was to preach and proclaim the law of the Creator. Even if there were only one Japanese Christian in the whole country, any missionary would spend all his life here just for the sake of that one person. These men were very, very zealous, and the conditions were rather good for the conversion of people to Christianity. When you have bloodshed, revolutions, fighting, battles, death in large numbers, Obviously, people's thoughts do tend to go to the next life. In little more than 50 years, these missionaries established over 200 Catholic churches, primarily in southern Japan, and converted up to a quarter million Japanese. when a Japanese lord or Japanese daimyo changed his religion, he would bring pressure on his people because he had absolute power of life and death on the people below him. And so you got in a relatively short, short period of time, a large scale conversions. But there was another factor that some of the daimyo, when they became Christian, they had certain considerations of commerce in the back of their mind because where the missionaries went, the Portuguese merchants went. And the Portuguese merchants offered very profitable trade vis-a-vis -vis Japanese. Commerce and religion intertwined. Some Japanese profited while others watched with growing concern, convinced of Christianity's threat to their power. Merchants and missionaries, these early Europeans had set a course which would eventually run into unexpected consequences. of never-ending training, to remain clear-minded in the face of grave danger, to face death matter-of-factly. This is the art of kendo, the way of the sword. Master swordsman taught young samurai the skills of sword fighting and the traditions of a samurai code of honor. This was the education the young Ieyasu would receive, even as a hostage. When you took a hostage in a certain class, they were usually treated very cordially, and they were given education as, just as they would be um, given at home. He probably had a very stoic, Spartan kind of education, taught military skills, martial arts, and Chinese classics, Japanese classics. The entire life of Ieyasu was that of patience and forbearance, people say. The young hostage, Tokugawa Ieyasu, would learn what it meant to be a samurai. Adapt a stance with the head erect. 
neither hanging down nor looking up, nor twisted. Do not roll your eyes nor allow them to blink, but slightly narrow them. Brace your abdomen so that you do not bend at the hips. A legendary swordsman, Miyamoto Musashi, would preserve the way of the samurai in a classic book, The Five Rings. It was a guide to strategy, its philosophy embraced in Japan even to this day. In all forms of strategy, it is necessary to maintain the combat stance in everyday life and to make your everyday stance your combat stance. At age 15, Ieyasu entered manhood and earned the right to carry the two swords of the samurai. The sword was a symbol of the samurai class. Only the samurai were authorized to carry two swords, a large one and a small one. The samurai, with these two swords, ruled over the farmer and the merchant. You're born into being a samurai, it's a responsibility. Amongst the responsibilities of being a samurai was always carrying one sword uh, to use to enact justice. If somebody were rude to you, it was your duty to kill them. But still, no samurai would walk around outside without a sword. And if they were caught without a sword, they could be punished for not upholding their duty. While the samurai class comprised less than 10% of the population, their presence loomed larger than life. Even the missionaries wrote as if the samurai were the whole of society. They carry a sword and dagger both inside and outside the house and lay them at their pillows when they sleep. Never in my life have I met people who rely so much on their arms. They are very warlike and are always involved in wars and thus the ablest man becomes their greatest lord. It was not only the men who swore to uphold this ideal. Samurai women were also trained to protect their family. The most important thing about samurai's daughters or wives uh, was never to forget the honor and the pride as samurai's daughter. In crisis, they would have to be prepared to kill themselves rather than be shamed, disgraced by the enemies. The samurai defended his home and family, but his true glory came on the battlefield, defending his lord against enemies. The samurai dressed carefully for combat. The finely stitched fabric and leather appeared elegant, even fragile. Unseen were the tightly woven plates of steel. Much like his protective armor, a warrior's refined appearance concealed his impenetrable inner core. This ethic, preserved in writings of the samurai, would prepare the warrior to meet life and death with honor. A samurai would wash himself with cold water every morning, scent the shaven top of his head and hair with incense to make himself presentable. He was ready to be killed in battle at any moment. Cherry blossoms are often compared to the samurai. They are a beautiful sight like the warrior in his shiny armor, but it takes only one big storm for the petals to fall to the ground, just like the warrior in battle. 